Hello, my name is Andrew Westover and I'm the key pairing director of education and public engagement at the new museum. I join you today from the unceded land of Lenape people. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging and paying respect to Lenape people and elders and ancestors, past, present and future. On behalf of the new museum, I am glad to welcome you to today's panel conversation entitled The Fluid City from Death to Life with triennial artists Krista Clark, Harry Gold Harvey IV, and catalog contributor and curator Carson Chan, along with moderator Margot Norton, Alan and Lola Goldring curator at the New Museum. Programs like this are core to the New Museum's work of advancing new art and new ideas. This program is presented in conjunction with the opening of the 2021 New Museum Triennial Soft Water Hard Stone, which is currently on view. The exhibition is co-curated by Margot Norton, tonight's moderator, and Jamila James, senior curator at the Institute of Contemporary Art, Los Angeles. I would particularly like to thank education and public engagement staff members, Andrea Calderes and Derek Wright, as well as the entire New Museum team for their help bringing this program together. New Museum public programs are generously supported by the Bowery Council and digital initiatives are supported by Hermione and David B. Heller. We also thank our members and supporters like you who help make these programs possible. I'll now share brief biographical notes about each of today's panelists. Carson Chan is the inaugural director and curator of the Emilio Ambaz Institute for the Joint Study of the Built and Natural Environment at the Museum of Modern Art in New York and a curator in the museum's Department of Architecture and Design. Chan is also the co-founder of PROGRAM, a nonprofit project space and residency program in Berlin. In 2013, Chan served as executive director of the Biennial of the Americas in Denver and co-curated the fourth Marrakesh Biennial with Nadim Samam in 2012. A widely published author and commenter on art, architecture, and contemporary culture, Chan is editor-at-large of 32C and a founding editor of Current, Collective for Architecture, History, and the Environment, alongside Daniel A. Barber and Dilal Moussaid Alsier. He holds a bachelor's degree in architecture from Cornell, a master's degree in design studies from the Harvard Graduate School of Design, and doctoral coursework from Princeton University. Krista Clark lives and works in Atlanta, Georgia. Recent solo exhibitions of her work include Untenated, at Spencer Brown Gallery in New York, Baseline of Appraisal, the Museum of Contemporary Art of Georgia, and At the Corner of the Sublime, Heights, Manners, and Views at Callenwald Fine Arts Center in Atlanta. Clark's work has been shown in group exhibitions at the Zuckerman Museum of Art in Kennesaw, Georgia, the Atlanta Contemporary in Georgia, the Studio Museum in Harlem, and the High Museum in Atlanta. She was awarded the Artadia Award in 2018 and the Working Artist Project Award in the same year. Harry Gould Harvey IV lives and works in Fall River, Massachusetts. Recent solo and two-person exhibitions of his work include The Confusion of Tongues at Bureau in New York, Faith Wilding and Harry Gould Harvey IV at David Winton Bell Gallery at Brown University, and Harry Gould Harvey IV with Species, Atlanta Contemporary. Harry's work has been shown in group exhibitions at the Centre d'Art Contemporain Bedney, Leroy Neiman Gallery at Columbia University, Hotel Art Pavilion in Brooklyn, and Kunsthalle Wichita in Kansas. Harvey is the founder of the curatorial project Pretty Days and co-director of the Fall River Museum of Contemporary Art. And now a few logistical notes before we begin. This program will last for approximately one hour. If you would like to ask a question, feel free to use the Q&A function at any time by clicking the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen to type your question. Please note that this program is being recorded, so your question will be recorded as well. I encourage you to learn more about our upcoming public programs on our website, newmuseum.org. Now, without further ado, I turn the conversation over to tonight's moderator, Margot Norton. Thank you so much, Andrew, and so honored to be here today with you all to speak about the topic of the fluid city from death to life. This is the third roundtable discussion in a series of five 
which are held in conjunction with the 2021 New Museum Triennial Softwater Hearthstone, uh, which I curated with Jamila James, and is on view at the New Museum now through January 23rd. And I hope for those of you that are in New York who, or who are able to travel to New York, that you'll have a chance to see the exhibition in person. And for those who can't, we also have guided virtual tours of the exhibition, including one upcoming this December 10th, and two more roundtable conversations in the weeks to come, including one on mediated bodies on December 16th and uh, one on colonial legacies on January 13th. And you can register for these programs on newmuseum.org. And all past recorded programs are up on newmuseum.tv and on the events page on our website. So uh, hello to those of you watching in the future as well. Um, today, we are going to be discussing some ideas around the theme of the fluid city in the triennial, and we'll be in discussion with two artists participating in the exhibition, uh, Harry Gould Harvey IV and Krista Clark, as well as curator and architecture writer Carson Chan, who also contributed a wonderful interview in the triennial catalog with artist Nadia Bellaric. I'll begin by giving a brief background about some of the ideas behind the theme of the fluid city and its relationship to the exhibition. And then we'll move into presenting, uh, into presentations by the speakers about their work before moving into a discussion. And if there's time, we'll also take questions from the audience. So feel free to drop those questions in the Q&A function in the chat as they come up. So to connect onto the topic of the fluid city, I just wanted to start with a brief recap on the overarching theme and title of soft water hard stone. Uh, the title comes from a proverb that is popular in Brazil and found across cultures. And Jamila and I first heard the proverb from an artist included in the exhibition based in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil named Gabriela Moreb. Uh, and the proverb informed a work of hers and uh, which is also included in the exhibition. And in talking to us about this work, she translated the full proverb from the Portuguese as soft water on hard stone hits until it bores a hole and elaborated on how the proverb is said to have two meanings. One, which is about perseverance and resistance and this impact that a small discrete gesture can have in time. And the second, which is about ideas of impermanence and inevitable change, things that I feel like we've all had a deep lesson in these past years. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of thinking about this idea that with time, uh, it can destroy even the most perceptibly solid materials. And so in the triennial, there are many artists kind of embracing these ideas of transmutation and transformation and instability and works that shift and dissolve or works that destabilize this idea of the static art object. Um, and we think of many of these works as catalysts in the way that they kind of give life to the remains of collapsed constructs. Um, and so with this title, I did also want to mention that there's this idea of reciprocity and that, you know, through the interactions of the water and stone, right, the water becomes absorbed into the stone and in turn, tiny particles of stone are then broken off, submerged into the water and perhaps travel with it to eventually become new stones. So this idea of reciprocity or cycles of growth and decay are part of this idea associated with the fluid city. Um, and so I wanted to mention that and particularly on the third floor of the exhibition where both Harry and Krista's works are situated, there are many works that speak about this relationship between architecture and the body and this reciprocal relationship that exists between the environments that we create and our own selves. Um, so the fluid city is actually also the title of a section in my essay for the book, which is here. <laughs> um, and uh, I uh, wanted to read a brief uh, part of it, which is a segment from a poem, Ozymandias, which is written by the English romantic poet, Percy Bysshe Shelley. Um, and so I'll just read a short segment of it here. Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell us that its sculptor, well those passions read which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, 
the lone and level sands stretch far away. And so uh, I began this kind of section of the essay in speaking about that because I was thinking about this kind of hubris that underlies the sparrow Ozymandias's proud boast, uh, as well as this inherent futility in the fact that, you know, creating monuments under this assumption that they'll endure forever and, you know, remain unchanging. Um, and felt like that poem reveals this truth that like the proverb, soft water, hard stone, uh, which gives the exhibition its title, um, that even the most colossal or sturdy structures are subject to decay. And that like us and everything for that matter, they too have a lifespan. Um, and so like the individuals that build them, they're subject to cycles of loss and regeneration and in constant need of reflection and revision. And as those material fragments kind of pile up, um, we're also kind of reminded of this untapped creative potential that we might uncover to give them new life. Um, you know, what happens when we layer and collage their forgotten fragments or carve into their surfaces or take, you know, the translucent skins of them and let the light shine through them. Um, and we can see examples of this uh, in the artworks in the exhibition, as well as in the following presentations. Um, and so uh, having said that, to give a bit of background, I uh, will actually now invite our speakers to present on their work and their practices in relationship to this theme, uh, starting with Harry Gould Harvey IV, and then Krista Clark and Carson Chan, and we'll follow up with a discussion together and hopefully have some time for questions. Uh, so I will now hand it over to our first presenter, Harry Gould Harvey IV. Yeah, thanks so much for involving me in this talk. I really feel appreciated to, uh, or I re really feel appreciative to be able to share my perspective uh, I'm an artist from Fall River, Massachusetts. Uh, I'm a self-taught autodidactic artist. Um, and I made a selection of images that just kind of, I think related to the etymology of some of the formal foundations of the works that I make now, but also like my intentions in getting involved with the, the art making process and trying to interject into the different art worlds um, at different points in my life. but. Um, this first slide here is uh, two earlier works from around 2015 and 2017. On the left, it was shown here at Chicken Coop Contemporary in uh, Portland, Oregon, which was a space run by Srijan Trudroy. I don't know how to accurately pronounce his last name, but it was an artist run space that was within a chicken coop and the chickens were the viewers of the work. So I made all these drawings uh, in 2015 and then over uh, around two, two or three years around the time that I made the drawings, I gathered the miscellaneous uh, materials that ended up becoming the formal and material foundations for the frames. So all this poplar is all milled up from trees on Aquinnick Island. Um, all this clay with this little clay head that's forged from a, an island eight hours off the coast, uh, or sorry, eight hours up into Maine, an hour off the coast. And through kind of like creating these new combinations, I try to create like uh, poetic connections and draw lines that seem maybe more visibly to, visible to me that have yet to be uh, elucidated in relating to um, the ecological and like, uh, unseen connections within our kind of our worlds. Um, so this drawing, uh, sorry, if you wanna, this drawing here, I think is like, uh, as an autodidact, I've always kind of dealt with these boundaries. Uh, um, if I am a self-taught artist, then do I, I, am I an insider, am I an outsider? If there's a folk, is there a gentry? Where exactly do I stand within it? So this, I, I shared this drawing because it has like a, a snippet, like a linguistic morphism that has rung true throughout all these years, which is uh, the path towards salvation is to assume the ideology of a prophet of the realization that high art can only endure as spiritual art. And that there are these two walls kind of determined by different art markets, the one being this kind of insider monotheism with like a consensus under mastery and then this other outsider or more primitive or spiritual or less epistemological space. 
Um, and I, I guess over time, this drawing has revealed itself more and more to me, which I was really thankful for. And this sculpture here has a, a head made out of clay, which is meant to be a self-portrait, kind of peering up at a sculpture on a pedestal or potentially even a book. And that moment of kind of looking at an object and realizing miniatures to make sense of my large world has been like a theme throughout all of this work. So if you wanna to go to the next slide. Uh, this sculpture here is actually, it's, all these are just details. And like, I, I wanted to focus in on like these little specific moments within the work, but this sculpture here is clay from Swans Island in Maine. And these are Asiatic bittersweet vines that I stole from the Citibank estate in Newport. And then black walnut that came down during Hurricane Sandy uh, on the lands of the Newport mansions in Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, being from Fall River, Massachusetts, it's a uh, it's a socioeconomically impoverished post-industrial city about 20 minutes north of Newport. So while the Firestone mansions for the Firestone families were in Newport, the Firestone factories in Fall River were burning down. So there's always been this uh, dichotomy uh, of like a really wealthy kind of Victorian center that has a lot of opulence and gilding and then this kind of gothic post-industrial city with a lot of church spires and smokestacks you can go to the next slide here i guess so in kind of in an attempt to like trace some like the etymology like the etymology of the forms within my work i i uh found some repetition within these sculptures and this is a sculpture that I made in the year 2018. I think it was called Putting Klaus to Bed While Listening to Dead Mouse in My Head. And it was uh, kind of like this funny linguistic morphism. I don't even really like Dead Mouse, the DJ. But um, I ended up coming across this Klaus Oldenburg mouse from an archive of photos uh, in Newport, Rhode Island that were in the McKillop Library from a public installation uh, where young individuals in Newport were so frustrated by these large monumental sculptures. I think there was even, I, I may be wrong, maybe Mark DeSubio or Robert Grosvenor, but there was a sculpture that was pushed off by the locals into the, into the ocean. And, I, and, I, and that really kind of struck me as to, like, as I'm creating objects as to where they will lie or what viewership might take value into them or or how different communities that I interact with might reject certain aspects of it. Go to the next one here. And then here, this is like a, another material, uh, like manifestation that attempts to elucidate like the poetic or ecological connections that are visible to me. These are, uh, um, this is all mahogany that's been brought over from, that's left over from, of shipbuilding in Fall River. This is oriented strand, bar, strand board from the commercial building supply. Um, while I was making all this work, I was having to subsidize it economically working as a, a contractor. So I was working on people's houses. And this sculpture is um, this moment in history, or it relates to this moment in history where uh, we were switching from spermaceti oil or whale oil uh, and that being the main kind of lubricant and fuel to uh, fossil fuels. And I became really fascinated by the primitive and vernacular architecture around the oil rigs and how it related to uh, the foundations of carpenter Gothic or more vernacular forms of architecture. See those little self-portraits hidden underneath it. Um, we'll go to the next slide there. Here's a little bit more as like, as these dioramas grew from these little singular moments of one perspective, I started to involve multiple selves to try to reconcile some of the paradoxical or absurdities within reality that I've yet to been able to really wrap my head around. Again, all these materials have like a certain ecological history, a certain material history. These are depression era grates on the left here on this sculpture. Uh, and those were used in gas furnaces in Fall River during the Depression era. This is black walnut, again, from the Newport mansions. This is a tree that was built, I mean, 
uh, probably, this is a tree that was planted probably over 200 years ago that came down during Hurricane Sandy. And that single tree has been like the material foundations for tons and tons of my sculptures. Uh, here's a little model of a sculpture garden. There's an Art in America mailer. All of those materials came out of the, uh, the trash from the Newport Art Association. I got every issue of Art in America from 1960 to 2000 or 2001, I think. So I started really involving all this detritus and kind of like trying to wrap my head around this absurd uh, statement, art in America. Um, you can go to the next slide here. So this is a kind of a, a material shift where I stopped working with these more, uh, I guess, I started working with more fluid materials. I started working with this uh, casting wax. And this casting wax is not meant to be shown as a final object. It's, it's usually uh, the sacrificial rue for casting uh, bronze. But I kind of became obsessed with the sacrificial quality, uh, the relationship to like uh, ecclesiastical or even like kind of Catholic traditions and just like the the pigmentation and the nature of the wax was really exciting for me because it allowed me to morph and blur boundaries between the built environment and the organic environment and it actually helped me start to trace formal foundations from the organic environment into how they may have been uh, transformed into the built environment um, if you look closely here on the left, this sculpture has like a loose depiction of Plato's allegory, the cave. So there's kind of the, like these kind of somewhat heavy handed, but uh, institutional tropes that I'm trying to deal with, with uh, reconciling, uh, pulling your head outside of uh, your, your worldview or, or trying to fracture your paradigm, whatever it may, that may be. Oh, we can go to the next slide here. So again, this is like uh, another Klaus mouse, but it's rendered in wax on top of uh, an Italian designer chair. I'm forgetting the name of the designer. Um, but again, putting Klaus to bed, uh, there's this kind of really droopy uh, liquid like permanence that's really exciting with the wax. It, it somehow like solidifies uh, what's some, something that's usually so kind of transitional. So the next slide. Here's some work uh, from my show at Brown University with Faith Wilding, just to give some more uh, material foundations of the work. This is all lost wax, casting wax, street sweeper, street, sweep, street sweeper bristles from the streets of Manhattan. Um, there's this whole kind of scaffolding, some transformational ladders, some relationships to architecture. And these, as you'll see in the works in the new museum, are wax sculptures that I construct on top of uh, unused job site heaters. So there's always, uh, I'm always trying to create like these dichotomous relationships between the material provenance of the work, but also um, elucidate certain his, historical events that relate to why Fall River is in a certain state that it is. Uh, the Great Fire of Fall River was started by what was called, uh, at the time, a kerosene salamander heater. Um, so this propane iteration, although it's out of code bureaucratically, uh, still many construction workers use it in Fall River similarly to the knob and tube wiring that uh, is still prevalent in a lot of the homes in addition to lead and other noxious materials so i'm really trying to i guess relate to those materials kind of dig at the root of them and and experiment freely and use these kind of objects of our built environment the street sweepers which are really if you look at the big picture, become like these extortion devices by making sure that we move our cars off of the streets that we pay taxes for. And they kind of like bring up all the detritus from the street and push it into our lungs. 
And sometimes these little spring steel structures shoot off. And that's where I kind of collect them and turn them into the scaffolding for these wax structures. You can go to the next slide here. So these are two details uh, of some found objects from Belcourt Castle, which is a, uh, it's a grand mansion in Newport Island, a Victorian era mansion. That was the mansion uh, to the Rothschilds, to the banking agent, to the Rothschilds. And uh, at the same time that it was being built, the architect Richard Morris Hunt was publicly funding the uh, base of the Statue of Liberty. And I found there to be some type of irony while like the American people are publicly funding this uh, representation of our individual liberties. He was working with like the oligarchs and aristocracy of the time to support his financial, like I guess mobility, but also to build these grand garish like Gothic structures. And these uh, blackened pieces of wood were actual architectural forms within the house that I excavated when I was younger and then charred all black. There's some of the transformational wax that I melted site specifically in, sp in the space to drip onto the floor. And then there's an example of some of the uh, white zinc that I make that has a high concentration of lead. Um, and those are some of the forms that are made out of the sacrificial wax. We can go to the next slide here. So this is again, like speaking of the etymology or, or my interest in like presenting this sculpture in the new museum, this sculpture is called uh, The Old Church is a New Defumigation. There's a, I think this sculpture is actually from Denver or maybe not, maybe it's another, maybe this one's in Florida, but this is an old Alexander Calder sculpture that I made out of uh, MDF and charcoal and colored pencil and put a little moisture tent over it and kept introducing moisture until these mold spores started growing out of the sculpture in the church. And this little palette here has miniaturized salesman's edition of asbestos tiles, a little roll of lead, some steel cable, and some more of those Swan's Island heads that I consider self-portraits. And then this is a sculpture originally by Tony Smith that uh, then Wade Guyton made a simulacrum of for Socrates Sculpture Park in 2004 that then I made an MDF and charcoal and mold simulacrum of. Um, and we can go to the next one. Here. And then this is the installation at the, the new museum. So, so kind of like speaking in that, thinking in that same kind of tangential thought of the old church being in need of fumigation, but also thinking about how we negotiate existing architectures and how they support uh, different paradoxes within them and how they provide space for human experiences that may be less literal than like the physical manifestations that become architecture. So I guess like these two church doors are from a church in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, they're what I like to say spatchcocked, so they're kind of broken open and inverted. Instead of the peak meeting, meeting at one precipice, that it's then kind of butterflied into two. And I plumbed these job site heaters into the locks and uh, constructed these sculptures out of different found objects and materials that relate to like the poetic foundations that I'm interested in kind of creating. Uh, there's some scap, scrap metal from the Whole Foods uh, in Providence where my friend's a fishmonger, some job site heaters, again, some more sacrificial wax, and these more personal uh, spiritual ruminations that I get then gild in these protectionary frames. You can go to the next slide there. I don't even know how, how if I'm being too tangential, if I'm off time or what it is, but. Yeah, so there's these two drawings here. Should I stop talking? Or? Yeah, I think we're, we're get, we <laughs> maybe need to move on. But thank you, Harry, so much for this presentation. This is amazing. Um, and yeah, I'll invite uh, Krista Clark to, to, to present next. And we just want to make sure we have time for the discussion after. Thank you so much.
Okay. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, I wanted to just um, first thank um, Margo and Andrew um, for inviting me to be in conversation with Harry and Carson tonight and just for giving me this opportunity to share a little bit more about my work. Um, and just, and also thank you to everyone who has joined us tonight. Um, I was just, so in listening to Harry, like the overlap um, in terms of between our work, um, these transitional spaces um, and um, also thinking about exposing materials and not uh, trying to create some type of illusion necessarily. Um, um, so for me, in, in many ways, and just thinking about this conversation tonight, I feel like I often um, entered the conversation through the back door. <laughs> um, I began thinking about this kind of um, spatial development, I guess, um, differently for myself when I became a homeowner. Um, so I live in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and when my husband and I purchased a home in 2013, um, I realized quickly it was not just about the plot of land um, that we now own, but also the community we are now embedded in. Um, and I realized that may seem extremely, extremely obvious that it's not just about your home, but the, your surrounding space. Um, but I don't think that every community or home purchase really provides that realization. Um, I live in Southwest Atlanta, um, so it's a little bit less than a five minute drive um, from the campuses of Morehouse and Spelman and Clark Atlanta University. And um, so three historically black colleges. And so moving into that space nearly eight years ago, it was really hard to avoid the complex complexities in the relationships and understanding and recognizing kind of my own agenda that did not necessarily align with um, the history of the existing community that we were moving into um, and recognizing, learning how to recognize um, where and when I am complicit um, in the <clears throat> erasure of history um, and communities um, just from my own actions. Um, and at the same time, um, I was partaking in my own kind of personal revolutionary act of making a place, um, a dwelling for myself and for my husband. Um, and I think, I know actually now that the success of that, of just creating my own um, space um, has become even more revolutionary. We all know in the past two years. And so it's really that intersection um, that prompted me to make the work and um, from which I kind of continue to make the work. Uh, so I divided the slides up <clears throat> um, into two um, shows that I had. And um, these first three slides, um, this starting with this one, um, is an image from a an exhibition that I had, <clears throat> excuse me, at the Museum of Contemporary Art of Georgia, and it is enti was entitled "Baseline of Appraisal." So the assumption that there is this bottom line um, for value, for aesthetic value, um, and so in thinking about and planning for the exhibition, the premise of the exhibition was to, to create these foundations like you see here. Um, so these foundations, some were poured concrete that we poured, um, they poured in the space. Um, and then others were um, these wood and fiber fiber fiberglass platforms that were not were also meant to serve as um, sort of these interior objects or more so kind of moving away from this foundational structure, but more of like a, a piece of furniture that you see on the right. Um, but also particularly in this piece that you're looking at um, in the exhibition, pointing to a transitional um, interior exterior space. Um, and so this, this space in which 
um, bell hooks that I always come back to and um, especially for, for this show in her book, Art in My Mind. Um, and then she has a particular chapter called Black Vernacular Architecture as Cultural Practice. And she describes the significance um, and she speaks directly to her own experience of growing up black in the rural South of considering this exterior, considering exterior spaces as the porch and as the yard, as an extension of the interior of the home and imagining um, and the imagining that occurs in, in envisioning that space, um, which un state built housing um, generally lacks or omits. Um, you can go to the next slide. So this is um, just another um, kind of assembly within that same exhibition um, of baseline of appraisal. And so I was also thinking about kind of this constant quest for order that we see um, in, in cities and um, society, um, this very kind of particular quest that I see also that kind of interrupts um, different communities, um, this order within this kind of minimal aesthetic. Um, and so in this piece that you see here, um, there's the poured two poured concrete slabs um, and then these found window frames. Um, there's drywall in the back <clears throat> and then also fiberglass that you can sort of see. Um, but I was hoping to sort of subvert that order by letting the molds that you generally would be discarded. Um, those molds, stained molds remained and preventing you from seeing the interior um, from fully being able to see that. Um, and so at the same time, these foundations were in many ways, again, meant to be spaces for imagining, um, imagining one's space, um, which again can be this very radical act. Go to the next slide. Um, so this is the um, last slide in, in for this particular um, show. So in this piece, we are seeing um, two pieces that are drywall. And I intended for them to represent sort of this idealized space. Um, so that they're occupying more so the space of the architect um, and not necessarily the builder. Um, and so the labor and, and these works um, versus the, the two earlier pieces is very different. Um, so the labor just in, in making these um, and kind of versus the performance and the labor and making the larger structures. Um, and again, these representing more so this kind of conceptual or imagined space. Let me go to the next slide. So um, the next two slides uh, are from a show that I had um, at Spencer Brownstone Gallery in New York um, entitled Untenanted. And so this came, um, both of these shows were in um, 2019. And this followed the, um, the, the last show that I was just speaking about. And so I started thinking about this objectification of architecture um, and how um, some have this, this privilege to approach it as a game, um, as opposed to, um, so the game of real estate rather than a space or more specifically um, this necessity of shelter. Um, and so I wanted to create these pedestals of scaffolding and thinking about them as these um, spatial ponds um, within a game that could never really be inhabited or, or even entered, but um, just, but only inquired or acquired, um, invested. And so here again, um, the materials are, are wood, fiberglass, um, concrete slabs um, that are, were actually reused from the previous show and then um, drywall again. 
and then the next slide. So um, this piece is actually, was important in informing um, how I started thinking about materials in terms of them interrupting space. Um, so this again is in um, the same show, was in the same sh show as um, in Spencer Brownstone. Um, and so it really prompted my interest in playing with tension and the placement of the materials within a space. Um, so it was a way for me to, so the, the board um, that you see leaning was about seven feet. Um, and so eventually, and it's being held by um, bungee cords. Um, and so, and it started to lean a little bit more, I think as the um, exhibition um, went, went on. But it was a way for me to realize um, how to intervene and disrupt a space. Um, and thinking about our relationship to the material, to the space. Um, and that intervention also was, I feel is, kind of, is created by leaving these materials in their raw state and not, again, embellishing them in any way. So that these are kind of the undersides or the innards of a structure that we're not necessarily um, meant to see. And then um, we'll go to the next slide. So these are um, the works that are in the triennial. This is annotations on um, Shelter Five. And so the two works in the triennial merge and continue my kind of observations and explorations, investigations of kind of interrupting these, um, these standards, these aesthetic standards, these kind of um, sometimes minimal aesthetic standards. And so I see these works again as acts of resistance. Um, so sometimes they are fragile acts of resistance. So the fiberglass um, you know, appears as this very fragile material, but at the same time it has, um, if you interact with it anyway, um, it's, um, you know, that the shards of glass are <laughs> extremely uncomfortable. Um, but these vernacular materials that I hope um, gain power through their disruption and as well as their vulnerability and simply being what they are, but also performing and taking up space unapologetically. Um, and a lot of the ways that I think about composing the materials um, sometimes happen from just seeing these sort of poetic happenings in this, um, the space in which I live in Atlanta. Um, and so honoring that space, but at the same time recognizing um, that there are also these very um, controversial conversations um, that are happening need to happen within those, those moments as well. And the last slide or next slide. Um, and this is the other piece in um, the triennial, um, also annotations, but annotations on shelter three. So it's a, um, cement slab that is about seven um, feet um, along with a work light and the work cord. Um, and the tent for me really represents a space of duality. Um, it can be a place of privileged escape or one of, of struggle. Um, it's another disruption, but it is also in this case, um, even pre preventing the cement slab from slipping <laughs> or crashing. Um, but it's, it's for me, it's defying standards and expectations. Um, and so we're, we're not meant to see a tent and cement together. We're not supposed to see a tent on cement um, and suggest so what that um, is. That, oops, and then we also have <laughs> the light. Um, and the light for me that you've seen throughout each of the um, exhibitions is really meant to point to this space of absence and presence um, pointing to the body um, and is also another attempt at, at placemaking um, and pointing to kind of this 
shared space, um, shared experiences that we have with these materials. Amazing. Thank you so much, Krista. Um, and I'll now invite Carson Chan to join us. Um, so thank you, Andrew and Margot, for the invitation to join this discussion. And thank you, Krista and Harry, for your presentations. Um, and I look forward to our conversation afterwards. So hung next to Harry's work in the triennial is this piece by Iris, Iris Tuliotu. Um, and it's a work made out of old lighting fixtures from, I believe, a fabric store close to her studio in Athens. Um, and through the exhibition, you can see um, the fluorescent bulbs flickering um, and, and the, the piece will kind of um, stop flickering um, as, they, as the bulbs start to um, wear out. And for me, the work speaks to the power of um, art to bring forth narratives about the material conditions of our lives um, and how they speak of the economic, political, social, and ideological context in which we live. Um, and I bring up Iris because in 2011, she was an artist in residence at an art space, um, a project space that I founded in 2006 with um, Fotini Lazaridou Hatsagoga, um, and it's called Program. Um, and the space comprises of um, a shared office space, uh, bottom left, a library, um, and through and there we made um, exhibitions that um, tested the disciplinary, disciplinary boundaries of architecture. So we would invite artists, um, dancers, um, and filmmakers, um, for example, to make architecture exhibitions. And one thing that is interesting about this um, project in relationship to the topic that we're talking about tonight is that it existed be, uh, because of the particular social and economic context of early 2000s Berlin. Um, and so the, for example, it was about 4,000 square feet um, in central Berlin. And it was the entire first floor of a 19th century um, hotel. And we paid $700 for it. So I think that given those conditions, um, you know, as young people we were able to you know, have this uh, space and then make exhibitions in there. So one can almost see the relationship between Iris's work um, and Athens um, as a kind of um, analog to how program is, you know, this exhibition space and Berlin, that there's a kind of, they, the, they speak to the co-constitutive nature of, of each other. Um, so here we have, we had workshops in there. Um, and so I was given the opportunity to think deeper about this co-constitutive relationship between the city um, and the cultural sector in 2013, um, when I served as the executive curator of the Biennial of Americas in Denver. And it was called draft urbanism for two reasons. Um, and one, it is because um, it recognizes the fact that a city is never complete. It's always a draft version of itself. There's never a final version of a city. And second, because it recognizes that Denver is a city that really uh, was built out of, um, built from bars. Um, and beer. And so the first institutions that, um, that were established in Denver um, after um, the mines, so it was a mining city, um, were the bars. And the bars served as kind of proto institutions, um, all sorts of other institutions. So they were libraries in the sense that they, they kept the newspaper um, and then people can go in and, and look at them afterwards. They were banks. Um, so the bartenders would give informal loans. There were hotels. Uh, the miners would sleep uh, in the bars, um, so on and so forth. And so for one of the first um, um, commissions I did for the biennial was to commission a beer. And I gave uh, the, the, the beer maker the same brief that I gave the artists and architects. Um, and then a beer was produced. And then, so in a sense, um, wherever it was served in the bars in, in Denver, the audience was kind of participating in the exhibition without, without really knowing it. Um, and so I took the lead, the kind of method for this exhibition from the Hansa Viertel, uh, which is a neighborhood in Berlin. And the idea was that um, instead of showing uh, representations of architecture, like photographs and models, the exhibition of this architecture exhibition showed actual buildings. So this was in 1957, um, and um, architectural luminaries of, of the day were given um, an entire building to build. And um, you can still go there today and see this exhibition. So I was thinking, how do we 
bring that kind, how do we make the city itself into an exhibition? And so the idea was to um, commission artists um, to make original work for billboards that would be around the city and also digital um, display um, monitors. And then also architects to, um, to make um, installations that reflected on the particular conditions of that site. And in fact, the artists were also asked to reflect on that particular neighborhood that, the, that their um, billboard was in. These are the sites for the architectural installations. Um, these are some of the billboards. And so, for example, this is a billboard by Douglas Copeland, um, Canadian author. Um, and so in 2013, Detroit was the first um, um, big city to um, file a chapter nine bankruptcy. And so on, this is on a highway going into Denver um, and um, Douglas um, wrote, welcome to Detroit. The entire world is now Detroit. Um, I'll just go very quickly through these. These are the architectural installations. This is um, um, Hotel Rehearsal by Alex Schwader. And he reflected on the fact that about 30% um, of downtown Denver is parking lot. And so um, the, the kind of barrier for developing on those lands is quite high. So he thought, well, what if we rehearsed the fact that we can you know, make a hotel here? So he, he made this truck that had this kind of a hotel room in it. And you could um, go in there and spend the night in there and see what it would be like if um, these parking lot spaces were actually built up. Um, this is Plan B Architectos, um, architects from Colombia who made um, shading um, areas in this uh, park that doesn't have any shading. Um, this is June 14 architects um, that made these butterfly cages around public furniture, um, kind of re responding to the question of whether or not homeless people belonged on this public furniture and what it would be like to bring another alien population um, to, to, to these places. Um, and this is Petzl von Alrichshausen's Mine Pavilion. They're architects from Colombia. And um, they wanted to uh, refer to Denver's mining history and also to build a structure that would give residents um, a kind of visual impression of what it would be to build on this median. And this is a median, it looks like a park, but it's actually a median of a um, eight lane uh, street that cuts downtown Denver in two. And so um, visitors were able to go inside. And also one thing that we did, um, another thing we did was that we put museum labels on um, public buildings in downtown Denver that related to the theme. And so this is the Daniels and Fisher building um, in downtown in Denver. And it was uh, designed, it was uh, a kind of a replica of the Campanile in, in Venice. Um, it was built in 1910, but the one in um, Venice was uh, destroyed in the fire and was rebuilt in 1912. So in fact, this one is older than the one in San Marco Square in, in Venice. And we found that just by simply putting a museum label on a building, the building becomes uh, transformed from something that you walk past into an object of, um, of inquiry, into an object of attention. And so um, I think I'll stop there um, so we can talk. Thank you so much, Carson. Um, and thank you everyone for your incredible presentations. Um, actually in listening to them, I was thinking about uh, you know, specifically this idea about how in all of them, there's like this great relationship to the kind of physical material that you work with, or, you know, the kind of existing architecture that, that you work with, Carson. Um, I love that last project that you shared with the museum labels around the city and kind of using the existing architecture uh, as part of the show. Um, and so like this relationship between physical material, but also the conceptual ideas behind the use of that material. Um, and, you know, in all of your works, I feel like there's this kind of deep engagement with the uh, histories and the hierarchies and the power structures that kind of underlie, underlie these, um, but that the work doesn't kind of stop there. It also reveals so much, many of the possibilities that can exist to kind of give new life to, to, to these places or to, to these remains, if you will. Um, and so I wanted to ask if we could all kind of speak a little bit about um, 
these ideas in you know relationship to the materials that you use um and maybe we could start with harry and just kind of talking a little bit about you know i i loved your descriptions of these works because they're like this is the walnut wood from the Newport mansions. And then this is the job site heaters from Fall River, or these are, you know, the bristles from the street sweepers. And like, how do you go about finding those materials, first of all? And then how do you decide what new forms they're going to, to, to be? Like, do you think, do, do those come to you when you find them? Do they come later? Do you collect these things? Yeah, just if you could talk a little bit about that, that'd be great. Yeah, so <clears throat> I guess I got into the art making process as a photographer. So then I started to kind of uh, seek out objects in the world and started to document them as sculpture. And that was probably in like 2012 and 2013. And then once I kind of built like a visual library that was pretty primary, it had like circles, triangles, lines, maybe like a painted buoy or like a an unauthored uh, anonymous sculpture or a piece of folk sculpture. And I kind of like built this uh, foundation of anonymous objects that expanded into like the built environment and trying to discern architecture for myself and deconstructing certain structures while actively like working as a as like a contractor. So I guess like a lot of my work is kind of at the precipice of where institute the institutional and bureaucratic worlds meet the vernacular. That's because I'm coming from like a autodidactic uh, and like vernacular center. A lot of contractors would uh, would like shake their fists at most architects and most like uh, like laborers would be frustrated with like building plans because uh, the way that materials relate to the human body, I think are different in the vernacular tradition uh, versus based on like uh, kind of like the standardization of the industrial processes, like the four by eight sheet, I guess that's like for one human to carry it. So like, I, I guess I, in speaking of, about all those things, like working as a contractor, siphoning my capital from uh, wealthier families who were upholding these old Victorian homes, going back to live in like tenement filled neighborhoods in Fall River. I really started to figure out how I, I, I wanted to figure out a way that I could find objects from the everyday world that had these uh, tethered and historical meetings. So I could interject myself and create this dichotomous conversation where it's like, yeah, the street sweepers are from the streets of Manhattan, but like those same families that are fueling the furnaces in Fall River are building the museums here. So I think it's important to think about like the inter interconnectivity of how we participate with these institutions while trying to like uh, deconstruct certain aspects, rebuild certain aspects. And there are like little formal things that just really excite me, the high Gothic, um, I really like to think about uh, gargoyles and stuff like that. So then that became the formal foundation, but just trying to figure out ways to create like this uh, poetic dichotomy of like, uh, it's, and it doesn't always have to be like uh, a thing from the world of wealth and something from the vernacular. It could be like completely inverted. It's not that I want the that to only be the only dichotomy because as we know in life, it's a lot more nuanced. But. I loved hearing, hearing you talk about these relationships between this because it's also something Krista that I noticed a lot in your work, like how one thing is propping up another or how they're like, they need one another somehow. Uh, otherwise they would collapse. Um, and yeah, I'm curious to know a little bit about your process with these materials too. And even you know how you see them relating to these ideas of value and hierarchy that you were uh, kind of speaking about before, um, you know, just like the act of pouring that concrete slab was was quite something in the show. <laughs> um, so I'll, uh, I'll let you speak a little bit about that. Um, yeah, and I think similar to um, Harry, I'm all, I'm often very much drawn to the formal elements of the materials. Um, so. A lot of times it will be, especially even more so when we kind of first again moved into um, where I live now, seeing 
so much um, transition and and um, and also taking into account that Atlanta is like this is a driving city. So making those observations from being in the car as opposed to um, necessarily walking from place to place, which I know I need to do more, <laughs> but very different than like in New York then. Um, and oftentimes it was just about seeing these incredibly beautiful moments of these materials that um, would kind of fall and were kind of very flaccid and, um, and having this moment like that space was just so beautiful, but then also it was, you know, also what it um, signified and that, you know, something was being, something was falling apart or something was being erased or um, a history is being erased. Um, and so I think coming, moving that into the studio and finding those, taking those materials that are not always, it's, it's a combination of new and found. Um, but thinking about what is kind of stacked on on top of something else, like what is in the foreground and what is what is being covered or what is being um, erased, um, more so I guess in my works on paper. But um, and then there's been a shift recently in making the concrete, where it becomes very much so about the labor in making the pieces, um, and and a little bit less about where they're found, um, but incorporating another object, um, like the found object along with the labored object that I've made. I also like love that, you know, it's also calling attention to the structure of the place where it's shown, like that, um, you know, concrete stuff that's resting on the museum wall, like the wall also becomes part of the work or embedded in that, um, which kind of brings me to asking Carson a bit about uh, the Biennial of the Americas, I feel like, that was such a beautiful gesture to like make the city itself, the part, the exhibition. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that choice um, to, to also call attention to these existing structures within the framework of that show rather than, you know, provide the models or, or the, the photography. Yeah, no, I think, you know, I, it was something I thought about um, the year before when I curated the Marrakesh Banyol. And Marrakesh is a place that um, doesn't have uh, or didn't have a contemporary art museum or gallery culture. And so my question was, how do I, how do I show um, contemporary art to um, many people who haven't seen contemporary art in their city before? And so the idea is like, what if we um, didn't have it in a museum um, or in an in indoor space, but just had it out in public so people would come up across come across the work and not have to decide to go into a place to look at the art and it worked out really well and um i wanted to you know repeat that kind of strategy for denver and i think you know what i mean what i saw in terms of um similarities with you know harry and, and chris's method is the idea of transforming um how materials can be transformative and how they can transform themselves and so in wanting to transform the non-visitor into a visitor, you know, even if just it's something on the street. Um, I thought about, um, um, for example, using a material or substance like beer, you know, to get people um, into the show before they even knew they were in it. So we made coasters that said that this beer is made in this particular way and it, it's part of an exhibition and there's information about it. Um, but, or you can just have the beer and it doesn't matter. But I think to, to think about different materials like beer, for example, and, and see how it could become a discursive kind of material um, was, yeah, very much part of the method of that show. Totally. Um, and I, I wanted to make sure I also ask you, uh, Carson and Harry, about the institution building that, that you do, because I feel that that is also um, an important part of this. Um, topic. Um, and I think it's also interesting that we're all kind of talking about cities in the US that aren't considered centers, like New York, uh, where I'm based, or LA, where Jamila is based, um, you know, talking about this show in Denver, Fall River, Massachusetts, Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and uh, I, yeah, I wanted to ask, you know, Harry, you know, in addition to being an artist, you also have the uh, Fall River Museum of Contemporary Art, 
uh, and also the curatorial project Pretty Days. Um, and Carson, you know, also with your space program, uh, which is this project space and residency program in Berlin and with current collective for architecture, history and environment. Um, I just wanted to ask if you could talk a little bit about this institution building that you're doing. Um, perhaps we could start with Harry just to kind of speak a little bit about Fulk River Mocha uh, and uh, you know how and why you decided to build your own institution. Yeah, so I guess um, like, Originally, the nomadic curatorial project that I uh, co-founded with Gregory Kalici uh, started having shows, I think, in 2017. And that was not a, a not solely out of our frustration of the white cubes, but our interest in offering like a temporary autonomous zone that doesn't have any relationship to um, like any type of lease holding or whatever just a kind of like a cultural happening where we could set up art either permissed or not depending on what the parameters were for that like curatorial microcosm and then set up this show and have something really kind of temporary only there for people who saw it and then documentation provided online and i did that project for like a couple years with greg we did a couple shows down in miami um we did a couple shows in new york and fall river and uh, all the while, Brittany and I, who co-founded FR Mocha, had been also like kind of trying to draw connections between local colleges to tr try to provide resources to the public colleges in relation to the private institutions that are like the big uh, stakeholders in the region, such as the RISDs and the Browns, so that they were interfacing with CCRI and the community college over at Fall River. And we ended up kind of getting in conversation with these Azorian curators, uh, Jesse James and Sophia Botello, and they reached out to us to curate like a two day exhibition. Now we have like a nonprofit museum with a board, an advisory board. We've had, we've been open for just over a year and a half now. We've had 2000 visitors. We're providing like free contemporary arts education for the public schools. But I think a lot of the foundations came from frustrations and excitements and new arrangements and how we can orient objects in relating to space and how once we orient those objects, they could help cultivate community and how we let people know, uh, how we let people in on this like specialized fields of knowledge. So it's not so esoteric, so they don't feel so like isolated away from it and kind of like, I guess, turn it into like a, a trend transformational space in and of itself that's not as fixed as some of the other institutions that I also participate and exhibit with. It's like kind of helps me deal with the more fixed relationships or institutional or bureaucratic relationships that I have to deal with as a practicing artist myself. So it was really nice to hear Carson talking about uh, Berlin and like the, the, uh, the ability to make it happen because of the socioeconomic restraints and the viability of space and kind of all the things that are really relevant to Brittany and I running FR Mocha and Fall River, but yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, um, if, if it weren't for the kind of material political um, context of Berlin, I don't, we wouldn't have been able to make that space. Um, so we basically paid for it by selling beer at the openings. And so, you know, come up with 700 bucks and then, you have an institution, um, and that, but I, you know, to answer Margot's question a little bit, like why, why an institution? I think um, you touched on it a little bit, Harry. Is that I, in many ways, an institution is really just a kind of um, excuse for forming a, a community, and um, we wanted to. At first, we had a very specific question with, uh, for program, which was, how do you make an architecture exhibition? Um, what is an architecture exhibition? And it's, and it's a question that's not ever satisfactorily answered. When you go to an art exhibition, you see the actual art. When you go to an architecture exhibition, you often see representations of buildings. Um, so photographs and models and such. So um, the problem of not being able to put a building inside a gallery, you know, creates this perpetual conundrum for architecture exhibitions. So we wanted, so the place was, the project was, um, ostensibly kind of founded to answer that question or, or to probe that question some more. It ended up being a kind of 
gathering space for a lot of expat um, artists that were living in Berlin. And so um, what was interesting is that the transformations took, took so many different forms, you know, in uh, what the kind of uh, space meant uh, to begin with and what it, what it ended up doing. And then also in terms of um, um, the area, you know, Krista was saying that she was very aware of her own role in the change in the community uh, through her work. And by starting an art gallery or an art space um, in what was then the kind of most northern part of central Berlin that anyone would, would ever go to, um, helped um, make it into a central place. So from paying 700 euros a month, um, by the time we were we left, they wanted to raise the price to about 13,000 euros a month. And so um, seeing that kind of change um, and thinking about one's relationship to that change um, was a big part of that institution as well. Yeah, and that note I think is a good place to stop, right? That 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 idea of that you know creating community being kind of central to this, I think, is so beautiful. Um, and I thank you all for your collaboration on this panel and for your great presentations. And it was just amazing to hear from you. And um, yeah, no, thank you so much. And uh, take good care. Thank you.